Did you know that 85% of the world population is affected by light pollution? And that one in three people in the world today cannot see the Milky Way from where they live? Actually, that statistic is quite old, and I'm sure it's much more than that by now. That's why I'm always telling amateur astronomers to take the time to go to a dark sky site to see the Milky Way, meteor showers, and have a much better experience stargazing with your telescope because you'll see so much more in a dark sky site. But it comes with its hazards. For one thing, most Americans, and probably other countries as well, have to drive a hundred miles or more to get to a place where they can see the Milky Way. It's late at night, and it's time consuming, and it has other hazards. So in this episode, I wanted to give you some tips for stargazing in a dark sky site. Hello and welcome to the program, Sula's Big Adventures, with me, Sula. This episode is about tips for stargazing in dark sky sites, meaning somewhere other than your house, unless you're lucky enough to live in a place where you can see the Milky Way and see deep sky objects. But for most people, they have to drive uh, quite a distance to get somewhere where they can see the Milky Way, uh, at least a Bortle 3 or better. And that means a big time commitment and driving a long way late at night and maybe it's a remote area that is not entirely safe because by definition the dark area would be in a remote area or difficult to get to. There are a lot of hazards associated with going out to a dark sky site. So let me tell you about a recent experience I had going out to a dark sky site and give you some tips to take into consideration if you're going out to a dark sky site to stargaze. When I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, I can't stargaze from my house. Not only is it light polluted, but I can only see a very small area of the sky because of houses around me and trees and obstacles. So I pretty much have to drive to get to somewhere where I can see the Milky Way. I have to drive about 100 miles from here, and it's about two hours. If there's no traffic, if there's traffic, it could be two and a half hours. And it means driving late at night and coming back late at night. So recently, I... I went out to my secret spot. It's not nearly as dark as another place that I go to often to stargaze, and that's Pinnacles National Park in Northern California. So I went out there, and I arrived around 8.30, and I was setting up my telescope, and I've stargazed there many, many times in the parking lot. And the ranger came over and shined his headlamps in my eyes, and he wouldn't go away. And so finally I said, can I help you? And he said, you can't stargaze here. And I said, of course I can. It's a public park. This is a public parking lot and I'm in a public space. I'm in the lines. And he said, well, you are, but you can't stargaze here. And I said, why not? And he said, because it's dangerous because of the traffic. This is park ranger Neerman, N-I-E-R-M-A-N. He's trying to give me a ticket for setting up my telescope in the parking lot at Pinnacles National Park. It's July 30th, 2024, and it's 9 p.m., and I am parked in a legal parking space in the parking lot, and he wants me to go stand in the bushes under an oak tree, correct? Not under an oak tree. I want you to step off to the side of the parking lot where you're not and full of traffic. And because of all the, see all the traffic? Uh-huh, yeah. At 9 o'clock, there is so much traffic in this parking lot. Well, I was the only car in the parking lot. <laughs> I don't, said, I don't know what you're talking about. There is no traffic. And he said, well, it's dangerous. You can't stargaze here. And if you won't leave, we're going to have to prohibit people from stargazing here. And I said, do you realize that in the bathroom there's a sign saying that this is a dark sky place? It doesn't have dark sky designation, 
but it does try to um, alert the public about it being dark out there and to not use bright lights on their campers and things like that. And he said, yeah, I'm aware of that, but it's hazardous and my main concern is public safety, so you're gonna have to move. And he wouldn't go away and I was losing precious time under the stars. So I finally said, okay, where do you want me to go? He wanted me to go in these bushes under a gigantic oak tree. And I said, fine. So I moved my telescope over there and finally he left. About 30 minutes later, when I was able to get my dark adaptation, <laughs> I saw a bolide. A bolide is a fireball. A fireball is a meteor that is brighter than Venus. So very bright. And a bolide is a fireball that explodes in the sky. I have never seen one. It was the first time and it took my breath away. I turned to say to somebody, did you see that? But I was the only person there, despite the ranger saying about the traffic. It was incredible and you have to go out to a dark sky site to see things like that, to see meteor showers and meteors and to see deep sky objects. You have to be in a dark sky site. I've never seen a bolide. They are rare, and I feel so lucky to have seen it, but I wouldn't have seen it at all if I hadn't taken the time to go out to a dark sky site. Well, I had a wonderful time under the stars there. I set up my telescope. I saw a lot of deep sky objects. Objects that are hard to see or you can't see in a light polluted area. And so it was well worth it to drive out there, but I decided around one o'clock, I was reluctant to leave because it was such a beautiful evening, but I decided I better drive back. So I packed up all my things and I started driving the two hour drive back. And if you've ever been to California in July, you know that it does not rain here in July. It doesn't rain here in July. Everything is brown and dead and it's dry as a bone. Humidity is very low and it's very dry. So imagine my surprise when I was driving along the highway at 65 miles per hour and came across about a foot of water crossing the highway. It caused my car to hydroplane and I went off the side of the road and I flipped several times and landed in a ditch full of water. I'm okay. I, I'm shaken up and, and it was traumatic, but I'm physically okay. I'm a little sore, but I'm okay. But it could have been much worse. And that's one of the hazards of going out to a dark sky site. You're driving late at night and often alone if you're like me. And it's just hazardous to be on the road late at night like that. I was able to get out of the car. But I was able to get out, but my equipment got mud and water all over it. In March, two of my telescope mounts were stolen out of my car, and I took my Las Mandy mount to my country home in Montana, leaving only this Orion Sirius EQG mount. I had it in a Pelican case. Apparently that case is not waterproof because it was inundated with water. You cannot get water on electronics. This is the electronic go-to mount and it's no longer made. In fact, Orion may be out of business, so that's the end of this melt. Just kept all my astronomy things in this think tank bag. It got inundated with mud, the water. It was full of eyepieces, my moon map, my jumbo pocket atlas that I just bought, and my uh, pieces and the filters and it got full of water. My Jack Reed battery got water on it. It will not turn off now. I set up the Pelican case. I'm going to say 1550 case that I had the metal in. It had water all in it. Biggest loss other than my car, which was totally Rosewater Agnes and LX85 Schmidt Cat Spring Telescope. It got inundated and get water and mud. Most of the water is evaporating, but there's still some in there. I don't know how to get it out, but it's full of mud as well. Anyway, I don't see how it could be repaired, but they will look at it. And the water ruined a Teleview Teton Bardo, an Explorer Scientific 10 millimeter, a Teleview Schwick Hasbrain adapter, and that.
to inch diagonal. My beloved Sony 14 millimeter that I use for Milky Way shots. I read it at lamp point too long. My Sony camera and a 24 about 105 millimeter using lens, a ZWA 224 astronomy camera, and my ad quality meter was demolished. And a oven cube light, and a bunch of other things. And terribly, those that criminal stole my astronomy logbook, I had been keeping my notes on little pieces of paper and making sketches and it all got wet and muddy. Horrible. Horrible. And it destroyed my 8 inch Meech McCast grain telescope, many of my eyepieces two Sony cameras and a lot of my, <laughs> my binoculars flew out of the car entirely. I don't know where they are. And uh, a lot of items were lost or destroyed. So tip number one is, I know it's a big time commitment, but consider staying overnight in a campground or in a hotel. going to the dark sky site with a friend and sharing the driving duties. Don't drive while drowsy, pull over and rest and drive cautiously because it is late at night and you never know what's going to cross the road. If it's just not practical to go with someone else or stay overnight, just consider resting for a while before you leave. If you're late for work the next day, tell your boss Sula said you had to. It was unavoidable. But seriously, don't endanger your life. It's not worth it. Rest, take a break, stay overnight, go with a friend, take precautions, and secure your own safety primarily before anything else. But I do encourage you to go out to dark sky sites because it is so much better to see things under a dark sky and enjoy the beautiful Milky Way and meteor showers and other things, seeing objects that you don't normally see naked eye. So that's it for now. I hope you got something out of this and I hope you will still go to dark sky sites and just take precautions. I'll see you soon. Until then, get outside and enjoy the night sky. Dark skies forever, Sula, signing off.